sermon is entitled, He Must Increase, But I Must Decrease. The passage I've chosen is John chapter 3, verse 30. My name is Reverend Derek Geller. I'm the pastor of the Keys Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Today we're going to talk about something that's very difficult, I think, for Christians to handle. You see, when we get gifts, spiritual gifts, we end up getting assigned a role by God. Whatever that role is inside of the church, it's very difficult sometimes for us to understand that role in its proper perspective. We're here to serve Jesus. We're here to serve the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. He is the cornerstone of the church. He is the one that we all bow our knee to. The problem is, is that when we get inside ministry, sometimes God blesses us beyond all measure. The ministry goes extremely well, and when that happens, sometimes the people in the congregation will look at you and say, Good job. You're doing awesome. You're doing amazing. You're doing great. And, of course, we take that to heart, and sometimes we can become arrogant in doing so. And what this sermon is about is encouraging both myself and everybody else to have the proper perspective. And what is that perspective? Jesus is first. Jesus is number one. Jesus is the one that we ultimately serve. And there are many times in ministry, and I've learned this over my lifetime, where we must become less and we must push hard to say, remember who we serve, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. But to start out with this, in order to prove the point that I'm trying to make here, I want to talk a little bit about John the Baptist, because he's the one who made the statement in the first place that he must, that I must become less and Jesus must become more. But let's talk about John just a little bit so we can understand the background of his story. It says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. You have two individuals, in other words, according to scripture, that were extremely well known, and they certainly came from the priestly line, so you would automatically think they're meant for great and wonderful and beautiful things. You know, in Zechariah, he belongs to this division of all these different priests, and at that time, there was a lot of priests. There was 24 different um, orders of priests, and of course, there was a lot of them. And as a result of that, of course, we're going to find out that they had a division of duties that we're going to find out here in a moment. But, you know what, both of them, it says, they were righteous in God's sight. And both of them, Zachariah and Elizabeth, God considered them right. In other words, they were not sinless, they were not perfect, but they were like Job. When they sinned, they asked God to forgive them. They went through the sacrificial system. And they observed God's laws, just like Job did, to the very best of their ability. God considered them right. He considered them blameless in his sight because of the effort that they had put in. But they were childless. Even though they were really great and awesome in God's sight, they were childless. They didn't have any children, and Elizabeth wasn't able to conceive. And on top of that, they're extremely old. In other words, Elizabeth's womb was long shut, so she could no longer have children. The age of them, both of them were approximately between 60 and 80 years old. The Bible doesn't state exactly how Elizabeth's wounds were shut, whether it was shut all of her life, she physically couldn't have children, period, any time period in her life, or whether that was because of old age or kind of a combination of both, which is more likely. But what it does say in Deuteronomy, if you don't have any kids, that means that God's not pleased with you. And that's what the people thought about Elizabeth and Zechariah. They sat back and said, you know what? God told us in Deuteronomy that we're gonna, he's going to give us all these kids. And the more kids you get, the more God's blessing you. And the only way that God's going to bless you is if you're doing right in the sight. But if you don't have any kids, that means God is cursing you, according to Deuteronomy. And as a result of that, they looked at Elizabeth and Zechariah and said, God must be very displeased with you. In some way, shape, or form, you must be sinning gravely against him, ultimately, because he's not given you any children whatsoever. And, of course, yeah, he said, they're both sitting back saying, we're not sure where we're messing up in life, but obviously God doesn't really, uh, he's not promoting us, that's for sure. One day, you know, at, this is beautiful, one day, um, Zachariah, he gets picked as one of the priests to go in and perform the uh, ceremony in front of the Holy of Holies, and, and to burn this incense. And this is rare. This is extremely rare. Number one, the 24 different divisions, he was one of them from Abijah, they got picked, their group got picked. And then out of all of the priests, and there was numerous priests, 
Actually, Zachariah got picked too as well. And this is a providence of God, definitely. And, and you know, Zachariah gets in there and he's given, he, he's going through the ceremony as he should as a priest. And then this angel of the Lord appears right in front of him. Right in front of him. And of course, he is absolutely petrified, it says in the scripture. He's afraid. He's very scared. And of course, the angel reassures him, don't be afraid. And, and says to him, by the way, I have heard your prayers, yours and your wife for children, and Elizabeth is going to bear a son, and you're going to name him John. You can just imagine how, how Zachariah is trying to get through all of this. He's sitting back saying, you know what, is this really going to happen to me in my old age? Is this really even possible? Elizabeth can't have any children. Her womb is long shot. How can this happen? But yet the Lord has told me this is going to occur. And the reason why Zachariah was so afraid it's because when the angel of the Lord appeared, he thought, you know what? Nabab and Abihu had actually burned strange fire, and the Lord consumed them with fire, killed them on the spot for not doing the ceremony properly. And I can imagine Zachariah was thinking to himself, wait a minute, did I mess up here? What other places in my life did I mess up? And is God really going to reverse his curse against me and actually give me children? Is that really going to happen? Well, it certainly did happen, that's for sure. And this is a prediction that was made. It was made over 700 years ago. Isaiah, the prophet. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be a prophet, by the way? Think about this for a moment. Here you are, a prophet. Now, a prophet didn't have a very good calling. The prophet, whenever they were called, you didn't want to necessarily be the prophet. Nobody jumped up and put up their hand and said, I want to be a prophet. Nobody ever did that because a prophet always came with the message of repent. In the Old Testament, always repent because God's mad that you're not living the decrees in which he gave you. Repent because you're been wandering away from him. Repent because you're for, uh, worshiping foreign gods. And of course, Isaiah is one of those prophets. And Isaiah got this message from God. And this is the message, a voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This prediction was 700 years before John the Baptist arrives on scene and he is born. And here's what the angel of the Lord told Zechariah. He said this, he is John the Baptist. He is never to take wine or fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Think about that for a moment. As far as we know, there was nobody up until that point, all the Old Testament, all the way up into getting into the New Testament, the arrival of Jesus Christ, there was nobody that we are aware of that was filled completely with the Holy Spirit, especially before they were born. This is why the Bible said that uh, John the Baptist, there was nobody up to that point greater than him. Up to that point, of course, excluding Jesus Christ. And anyway, this father, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's going to bring back the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents, uh, you know, to their children and the disobedience of people that are out there to the wisdom of God. And he's going to make ready a people prepared to meet the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Talk about an honor. Zachariah is in the middle of one of the greatest periods of his entire life. He's sitting back saying, I finally got chosen to go inside of the temple system. That, by the way, was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. So he got to go in and he got to perform the duties of a priest inside of the temple system. He's excited because that's rare. That rarely ever happened and most of the priests never got to do it. So he's sitting back saying, God has finally blessed me in this manner. And then he turns around and God sends an angel and says, by the way, you are going to bear John the Baptist. My goodness, talk about excited he would have been. That's for sure. Very, very excited. Now, here's where this story gets really interesting. We know John the Baptist was definitely a different individual. And we know John the Baptist himself, he sat back and he, he decided that he was going to have a ministry. His ministry, his specific calling, would not be inside the temple system. He certainly could have been there. He had two parents that were from the Aaron priestly line, and he certainly belonged there, one could argue very easily, but that's not where God wanted him. He would be the voice calling in the wilderness. He decided that his, his church, so to speak, would be in a wilderness, out in the middle of nowhere of all places. And the people came to him in droves, not because of John the Baptist, not because of the way he looked, not because of his charisma, they came to him because he had a message, and the message was from God, and that was repent for the kingdom of God is near. 
He had a message of incredible hope, and he had a message that all people of all races and all ages, and whether you're male or female or slave or free, all would be included into the kingdom of God by faith in a risen Savior. And of course, the people came to him nonstop, and he had a flourishing ministry. He had such a good ministry that the Pharisees started to get jealous. And the Pharisees went out to see John and say, what's all this commotion about? Because there's a whole bunch of people not attending the temple anymore. And people are leaving the synagogues and they're going out in the middle of this desert, this wilderness area. Why would they do that? There's no building out there. There's no gold, you know, beautiful building like the temple out there. All it is is a wilderness. Why are they going out there? So these Pharisees go out there and they see John. And John, of course, you know, he gives them a real hard time. He says, you brood of vipers, why are you here? Because you don't believe in Jesus. And let's fast forward to this verse in John 3.26. The apostles, the, 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 oh, sorry, the disciples of John, they actually are getting word. And they find out that Jesus Christ, after John had baptized Jesus at his command, now Jesus is going out into the various areas and he's starting to baptize. They get word, John's disciples do, that hey, here we've got all these different people now are going to Jesus and they're not coming to you anymore, John. Now they're actually going to Christ and they're bypassing you completely. They came to John, these disciples did, and said, Rabbi. That man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, and the one you baptized, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. What they were in essence saying was, we're jealous. We don't like this idea. We don't like the fact that somebody else has got far better ministry. John, you're doing so good. I mean, even the Pharisees were jealous of you. And now you're kind of slipping away. And this guy's taking over the ministry completely. And John the Baptist, he's sitting back and he's going and says, he replies to him, a person can only receive what is given to them from heaven. You yourself can testify that I said, I'm not the Messiah. He is. I told you that I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And when I baptized him, it was at his command. He really should have baptized me. I complained, but he still wanted me to do it to set an example for the world. And then he goes on and he says, he must become greater. I must become last. In other words, he is the Son of God. I am not. I am not the Son of God. I am not Jesus. I am not God. I am a servant of Jesus and God. You see, John, in great humbleness, knew his status. He knew where he belonged. He knew that ultimately he served the Lord, and the Lord was his primary focus. So when his disciples, John's disciples, came forward and said, Oh, by the way, we're a little bit jealous, and we think this isn't right, John said, I correct you. I always pointed to Jesus. And if he's becoming greater, praise the Lord, this is awesome. And I must become less because I am his servant. You see, even the way that John wore his clothes indicated his humbleness. I mean, he just had camel's hair all over himself. He didn't have any big fancy. He didn't have priestly robes or anything like that. He ate wild locusts and honey. He didn't have anything that he could sit back and say, look at my beautiful mansion, or look at my beautiful temple, or look at my beautiful church. He didn't have any of those things. He was a very humble individual. And this is what we need inside the church. We need leaders that are humble. Now, here's what I want to say. Be ready as I go through the next part of this to think about your own service. Now, if you are a leader, and I would argue anybody who's using their spiritual gifts to serve God are leaders within the church, you know, if you are a leader inside of your church and you're using your spiritual gifts, I want you to think about your ministry. I want you to think about your focus specifically. Why are you serving? Are you serving for Jesus? Or are you serving for those individuals that give you a pat on the back and say, well done, good and faithful servant? Are you more interested in getting, you know, more people saved and you're counting the numbers and say, whew, look at me, look how great I am. Or are you sitting back saying, you know, look at all the people that are coming to the church and there's more people inside of the church now than there ever was. That's part due to me and you're patting yourself on the back. If you're thinking this way, or if you even think that you have a little bit of that pride that's in there, then let's talk about how you can correct that. It's not easy, by the way. Very difficult to get somebody who feels they are successful within God's kingdom and they've made it all about themselves and not about God. 
it's very difficult to get them to change. And if you're one of those individuals, then I want you to think, and I want you to pray long and hard about this next section, because I'm going to give you a fellow, Apostle Paul, and you all know him. He is somebody who would openly, and he did, freely admit, I was doing the wrong thing. I was not doing what God wanted me to do. And Paul openly admitted, I was proud, I was arrogant, I thought I was doing the right thing, I thought I was a cat's meow. And he sat back later on and said, I was nothing. My, my accomplishments were nothing. What I was supposed to do was focus on Jesus. And eventually he does so. But let's talk about the story. First, Apostle Paul, you don't know him. I'm just going to go through some very quick facts that are important here. Number one. He was born in Tarsus, and you can see that on the map. That's in, in the right-hand side, about in the middle. And you can see all the other places around in Asia Minor that Paul actually went in and established churches. But he was born in this small place named Tarsus. Very important for us to know that Paul was a Roman citizen. And that's important for us to get because later on he would stand on that fact and that truth that he was a Roman citizen, but he was also a Jewish person too at the same time. Now, Paul was educated by a fellow named Gamaliel. I don't know if that's a picture of Gamaliel. We don't even have a picture of him. The problem, it isn't. But the reality is, is that Gamaliel would have looked something like that. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher. He was famous. In other words, the Jewish people looked up to him and respected him because of his ability to teach and the knowledge that he had obtained. And he taught Paul. Paul ultimately testified, I advanced in Judaism far above my peers because I was zealous for the traditions of my fathers. In other words, Paul is saying, you know what, here's the truth. We have two things in Judaism that are important. Number one is God's word. Of course, they would look at God's word and they held that in great and high esteem. And they tried to follow all the commands. But Paul went and flipped the coin and said, by the way, we have what is called traditions. In other words, we have things that we have, have decided that we need to do in order to follow that scripture. And they would hold traditions equal to scripture. And Paul sat back and said, you know what? I was zealous. I wanted to make sure the way that we worship God did not change in any way, shape, or form. I wanted to make sure it always did exactly the same. Now, Paul had a lot of accomplishments that he could stand upon. He talks a little bit about them, and then later on he calls them rubbish. He said they're not really important. But let's look at some of his accomplishments. Number one, he was circumcised on the eighth day. In other words, he was a Jewish person. He had all the credentials. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of all Hebrews, which meant that he spoke multiple languages, and he was very familiar with the traditions and the customs of the Jewish people. He considered himself as a Pharisee, as a guardian of the law, which meant that he wanted people to actually follow the law. He would go through it and say, you know what, the priests are not doing a very good job. While they teach about the law, they're not encouraging the people to follow it in their everyday lives. And Paul said, as a Pharisee, that's one of our roles. Our role is to introduce people to God's word. So number one, they understand it. And number two, that they follow it blamelessly. And Paul, he basically confesses. He says, as to the law, I was flawless. In other words, I followed everything that was in that law. Paul knew it. He understood it. He memorized it. And he lived that law. And he was zealous for the law. He got his power, not from Rome. Ultimately, he got it from the Sanhedrin and the synagogues. And that's where he got his ultimate power from. And despite all these absolutely beautiful credentials, Paul later on calls them rubbish. He says, you know what, they're nothing in comparison to knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. But when he started out now, he really thought these credentials meant something, very much so. Here's the thing. He goes and says, you know, he seeks the kingdom of God in a different way. Paul sat back and said, you know what? I like the Old Testament. I like Moses. I like his words. I like, you know, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And Paul sat back and said, I want the temple system to be primary within the Jewish culture. I want to make sure that nobody comes unto God except through that Jewish system, through the temple system. And you must be a Jew in order to enter into the kingdom of God. If you are not a Jew, then you must become a proselyte. In other words, you must convert to Judaism, and then you can get into heaven, but before that you can. And he sat back and said, it's through following, you know, all of God's laws that purity actually occurs, and this is the way we are right inside of God's mind, in his sight. It's by following these laws. So you first have to know them, and second, you have to follow them. And Paul preached that absolutely everywhere, and he said it's really important for traditions, the way the temple system works. 
the way the people work inside that temple system, the rituals that they do, all of those things matter. They're equal to Scripture. And of course, Jesus comes along and he says, entrance into the kingdom of God is not through genealogy. It's not through, you know, being a descendant of Abraham. It's not through being a Jewish person. It's actually faith in the risen Savior. And, and Paul didn't like that message at all. And Paul proved that zeal without divine wisdom can lead to opposing the very one that you're seeking to worship. Because Paul did that. Paul looked at God's one and only son and he sat back and said, I want to persecute you. And this is not me making this up, that's for sure. Because Paul openly admits it. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to scour scripture and get a whole bunch of scholars in a room and they all disagree about this. This is truth. Paul says this, direct quote, I intensely persecuted the church of God and I tried to destroy it. That's Paul admitting it. Paul, in great humbleness, said, I wanted to destroy all the people called the way. Those were the people that followed Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1.13, Paul says, I am, this is Paul talking, a blasphemer. A, a persecutor, a violent man. Paul said, that's the way I started out. Acts 7, 54 to 59, he says, I was there for the stoning of Stephen. I approved of that stoning. Stephen filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what? That didn't matter to me. I killed him anyway. I was there and I told the people, stone him, kill him. Why? Because he believes in Jesus. Acts 8, 1 to 3, with the authority of the chief priest that Paul got this authority, he dragged men and women out of their houses get this if they said they believed in Jesus Christ and they were followers of Jesus and then he put them in prison and then he would approve of them being executed. This Apostle Paul now, it's not the way we think about him but this is the way that he started out and Apostle Paul wanted us to know this. He wrote this in scripture. He told the people I started out wrong and I wanted you all to know how wrong I started out. Acts 26, 10 to 11, Paul even went so far as to pursue Christians into foreign cities and told the cities, the people of the cities, I'm going to take the Christians out of here because, you know, they've done wrong and I'm going to put them in prison and then I'm going to execute them. Paul wanted us to know that he didn't start out right. He wanted to know, us to know that his ministry, his leadership was on the wrong path. He wants us to know that he got so focused on, on the politics and, and, and so focused on following traditions that he forgot it was all about God. God alone has a right to tell us to make a correction in our lives. God alone has a right to tell us how to live our lives. God alone has a right to tell us what our ministry should look like. And God should always get the glory. And Paul wasn't doing any of those things. Paul was trying to get the glory for himself. Paul was trying to show the world, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. Look at me as I go out and persecute all the Christians. Look how powerful I am. And Paul admits it. He says, I'm a blasphemer. I'm a persecutor. I was a violent man, Paul said. And I want you to know this. Then one day on the road to Damascus, Paul meets Jesus. And Jesus says, Saul, which was his name at that time, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? You know, these words rang true within his heart. They resonated. He was struck with blindness. And this light from heaven told him, you know what, you need to transform your zeal. You are doing the wrong ministry for me. You are not living the right way. You're on the wrong path. You are focusing on yourself, Paul. You're focusing on your status and your level within the Judaic traditions. But you're not focusing on me. He's saying, I want you to go back and I want you to examine your life and realize that you're supposed to be serving me, me alone. And you're not supposed to be looking for positions of power and authority. You're supposed to be a humble servant. And of course, Paul meets Jesus. And he soon comes to realize that ministry success had to be redefined. Now, this would be hard for Apostle Paul. Remember, he's a Pharisee. He had memorized all of Scripture. This would not be an easy thing at all for him. But in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we find out it is by grace, through faith you are saved. It's by our faith, our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the law. It's really not. The law was not put away. Yes, it's still important to be righteous in God's sight. And yes, the law tells us how we can, be, how we can live a good and holy life. But here's the thing. If we want to get to heaven... It has nothing to do with whether we're Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. It has everything to do with our faith. Our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is all that matters. And Paul had to realize that and he had to get zeal for that. 
2 Corinthians 11, 2. The church is not a political entity. It was never meant to be that. It's meant to be a church that ultimately bows to the Lord. Jesus Christ is a cornerstone of the church. And those who belong to the church are those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Hey, sometimes we make our churches political, don't we? We sit back and say, you know what? I gotta get power. I gotta get as many people in the church on my side as I possibly can so I can get things done, so I can look really good. But that's not what the focus is supposed to be. The focus is supposed to be serving one another in gratitude and love and ultimately bowing our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ in doing so. We've got to have a servant's heart. In Galatians 3, uh, 23 to 29, faith ultimately is what makes you a descendant of Abraham. Paul redefined himself what it meant to be Jewish, so to speak. He said, you know what, I agree. The Jewish people, they are the light unto the nations. That's how they were originally called. And they are, you know, they're supposed to be going to heaven. And they're supposed to be telling everybody about the Lord. That's what they were supposed to do. And they weren't doing a good job of that. And Paul said, everybody who believes in Jesus Christ is a descendant of Abraham, part of this Jewish community or this chosen people that are going to get to go to heaven. Why? Because Abraham was considered right in God's sight because of his faith in God. In the same way, anyone who has faith in Jesus Christ is considered right in God's sight and gets to go to heaven. And Paul says, I redefine ministry. It's about service. It's not about lording positions of power and authority. It's all about serving. And I thought, well, praise the Lord. Talk about a complete turn. Oh my goodness. It wasn't, Paul said, you know what? The righteousness of Christ is what all, that's all that matters. Paul said these words to the church of Philippi, which is really encouraging. Consider where he came from. He said, do nothing in itself as ambition of being conceived, but consider others better than yourself. And I think that is so very true. He sat back and said, you've got to look at the perspective of other people, and you've got to look for ways to help them, and you've got to focus on serving them, but don't do it because you want the glory and the honor. Give Jesus the glory and the honor. And Paul said, I consider all the things that I accomplish inside of ministry absolute rubbish. All I want to know is Jesus. I want to serve him. I want to please him. I want him to get the honor and the glory because that is my calling. That is my focus. And I can only imagine, oh my goodness, how great and awesome that is to hear Paul say those things. Following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, how can we do this? How can we make sure that we're doing the right things in ministry? I can tell you it's not easy. It is certainly very easy to get into ministry. And once you see a little bit of success, of course, the people in the church are naturally going to look at you and say, whew, you did a really good job. They're going to give you compliments, and that's okay. We do need encouragement. I think all leaders do, but the problem is how do you handle that encouragement? Do you refocus that encouragement and say, Jesus is the one who enabled me to do this in the first place? And this is what we've got to get to as leaders in the church, and I think the church would be completely transformed if we were able to do this. And I think there's certain steps as leaders that we need to take. Number one, I think we've got to dive into Scripture. We've got to know and understand Scripture. Nowhere did Apostle Paul say, I'm, I, I'm not going to read Scripture anymore. Paul memorized Scripture. He knew and he understood it. Actually, Paul wrote an awful lot of the Scripture in the New Testament. But the reality is we need to study, to understand, to memorize, to meditate upon Scripture. And as we go through that, we've got to put a focus, especially as leaders, on being a servant. Any verses that we find that talk about servanthood, and there's plenty of those, we've got to memorize those and call them back to our minds every single time. A little bit of pride gets in there and says, look at what I did. We've got to sit back and say, look at what Jesus did through me. Praise the Lord. Jesus is awesome and amazing. We've got to get that kind of attitude. We've got to think about, as we go through Scripture, self-reflection. We've got to think about, how am I serving the Lord? Am I doing it with the right reasons? Am I doing it to get my own way because I feel I'm the only one that God speaks to? A lot of people feel that way. You want to be your own little island where you sit back and say, I'm not going to listen to anybody else. I just want to be my own little island, do my own little thing. And, and you know what? Whatever God tells me, that's perfect for everybody else. Is that what you think? Certainly Paul thought that. Paul was soon corrected. He was soon told, you are part of the body of Christ. You're not on a little island on your own. And you know what? And I think as we go through the reflection in Scripture, we've got to sit back and say, Lord, show me my pride. Show me where I am arrogant. Show me where I'm taking credit for things that you've done and help me to repent because I have, I have thought that way, which is wrong. 
I think we also got to sit back and do some humble acts of service. And I think that's really important for every Christian to do. I think we got to go visit people that, you know what, nobody else knows. You know, or, or nobody in the church anyway. You know, the people that you go visit and they're sick and they're, they're, they're inside their house and their circle of friends is very small. And we got to go visit them and spend time with them. And nobody will ever know we were there. But that's okay. Jesus will know we were there. And we got to spend time with the poor and the needy and the homeless and the people that, you know what, you'll get nothing back from them except gratitude. But that's all we should really want is to serve them in love and for Jesus to say, good and faithful servant. we got to sit back and think about ways that we can help our society see Jesus and live for Jesus. And I think as leaders, we really need to have accountability. I don't think there's anything wrong with having accountability partners. I do think that if a leader is in a ministry inside the church and they don't answer to anybody else, that's a recipe for disaster because that leader is likely to get very proud and arrogant because they don't have that accountability. Paul needed that. Paul could have used some accountability and eventually he did. Certainly, you know, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus held him accountable, but we need that in life. We need people to come alongside of us and say, you don't have the right focus. You're focusing on yourself and not on Jesus. And I think we need to, in all things that we do, especially as leaders of the Lord Jesus Christ, give God the glory. The things that we do should be for God. They shouldn't point to us, and they shouldn't point to the glory of the church. They should point to Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son. He is the one who should get all of the glory. And if we have this kind of focus, then we will remain ultimately humble. Now let's go back to the original statement. You know, John says, you know, here's the reality. He, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. This is the overall focus of this sermon message. To humbly serve the Lord is not an easy task at all. The reality is that people often will give us encouragement, and how we handle that encouragement truly does matter. If it goes to our head and puffs us up, of course, that makes us arrogant and proud. And if we get to the point where we're trying to push people around and lord our positions over them, then we cease to be good leaders with inside of God's kingdom. Everybody is given spiritual gifts, I think, within the body of Christ. And I think the, the gifts that we are given are given by the Holy Spirit, it says in scriptures. And those gifts are given based on what the, the Holy Spirit wants us to have, not necessarily what we want to have. Now, nobody has all the gifts. If somebody tells you, I am, and they list off all the different kind of giftings that are out there, and they say, I'm all these things and far more, then you could look at them and say, no, you're not. Because the reality is nobody has all the gifts, because if they did, then you wouldn't need the body of Christ anymore. It'd be just you and Jesus, and you don't need any more than that. But as it is, Paul says, we are interdependent upon one another. This is what Jesus expects out of each and every one of us. And I think we need to have the attitude, especially to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ. These are words that Jesus told us. If you want to be my disciple, then you're going to have to have a humble attitude. You're going to have to have your focus and your eyes fixed completely on me. And if you can't do that, then you're not going to be the kind of servant that I'm looking for. And I got thinking, you know what? I like Apostle Paul's word. He says, do nothing in a selfish ambition or vain conceit, but consider others better than yourself. We got to focus on helping one another, lifting one another up, encouraging one another, building each other up in the faith should be our primary goal. And we got to sit back and say, thank you, Lord Jesus or the chance to serve other people. And every time that we help somebody and they say, why, thank you, and say, by the power of Jesus Christ, I was able to help you. Give him the honor and the glory, not me. I'm just here serving him. I'm trying to please him the best that I can. This must be our focus. I want to finish with this. Apostle Paul, here he is in prison, and he's, he's expected to be executed, and eventually he would be executed. And here he is in prison, and he, you wonder what he would be thinking. Okay, his living conditions are absolutely deplorable. They're not good at all. And, he, you know, he's barely existing. And he's very uncomfortable. And he's hungry. And he's cold. And everything else. And he's sitting back saying, what am I going to do? And, and Apostle Paul sat back and said, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to praise the Lord with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I'm going to praise Jesus Christ. And in that prison, he said, ultimately, I have my eyes fixed on Christ. And he is my everything. He said, whether I live or I die makes no difference. Either way, I will serve my Lord because I love him fully and completely. 
Is this the way you lead inside the church? Is this your focus? Are you a humble servant before the Lord? Have you become arrogant and proud that you're accomplishing much inside of the church and you feel it's all you? Are you sitting back saying, it's my way or the highway? I'm the only one who has any say and the rest of you don't have any because God only talks to me. Are you feeling this way? If you are, you need to repent like Apostle Paul. You need to turn that zeal towards yourself and honoring yourself to zeal to honor Jesus. You need to repent and you must allow him to become greater in your life and you must become less because it's not about you, but it is about him. So I pray if you are a leader, and I imagine most of the people listening to this are in their own rights, I pray that you would be a humble leader, that you would focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, you would put other people first, and you would serve with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I pray that any pride that comes your way, you'd reject it completely, and you give God the honor and the glory always. And if our churches could only do that, my goodness, our churches would be flourishing. And can you imagine the transformation they would experience? And that's what I'm hoping for today. Amen.